Hi. So we have a lot to cover. I basically built a 90-minute presentation only to find out that it was 60 minutes, and then maybe 50 if we took questions. So I'm going to talk incredibly, incredibly quickly. Um, that's me. That's my educational platform. That's how you find me on Instagram. And really, that's all anybody ever needs to know. But we're not here to talk about that. We are here to talk about off-camera light for wedding photography. And when I very first got started as a wedding photographer, I hid behind this this misconception that I was going to be a natural light photographer because that's, you know, it's what you do. And I liked the look of natural light, which was very easy starting my wedding photography business in Tallahassee, Florida. Because every single wedding that I shot was at the beach, prep started at 3 in the afternoon, and I was done at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. if it was a long day. Everything was in the summer. There was always sun outside. I think in all of the years that I shot in Florida, I had maybe two weddings that got rained out, one, two. Then I moved to Brooklyn. And it's dark all the time in the winter. It rains. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide. The sun sets at weird times. Then it sets behind the building, and everything happens inside, and it's dark. So I had to start learning flash. And the problem that I was really encountering at the very beginning was how could I make the work that I was doing with artificial light look like the work that I was doing with the sun? Right? Because I didn't want to do these images of getting ready, where they're lit by window light, and then go to a ceremony and shoot that with natural light as, as directionally as I can, and then do these wonderfully backlit portraits, and then show up to the reception and shoot everything with flash on camera. Then it doesn't look like a cohesive day. So I started my, my path of integrating off-camera light, artificial light, multiple lights, one light, a whole way too much stuff that I bring to a wedding, because what I want my clients to look at when they see their images at the end of the day is, wow, we really love these images. Not, well, I can tell that you've used two lights to light this first dance, and I really appreciate your flash work during the toasts. They shouldn't see it. It should look as close to believable natural light to fit my style. So I think that there is something to be said for being a natural light photographer and liking that look, but I think that if that's all you want to do with your photography, you're doing yourself a disservice because you can make artificial light look like natural light if you learn how to use it. So for example, here are six completely different images. Some are lit with natural light. Got a couple in there that are lit with a video light. Some are lit with a off-camera strobe, and one of them is actually lit with an off-camera speed light. The goal here is that you can't tell the difference. And if photographers can't tell the difference, clients can't tell the difference, right? And I want my clients to look at these pictures later and say, wow, these are really beautiful pictures, and not be able to see the obvious light work. So the times of day that I am usually going to be using some form of off-camera light are going to be these three. These are kind of the main ones. Family formals, almost always. And by family formals, I mean pictures with the family, pictures with the wedding party, portraits, sometimes, but when I need it, it's super crucial, and receptions, a lot. Introductions, first dances, parent dances, toasts, cake cutting. Anytime I can get that flash off the camera, I'm going to do it. So these are kind of my top three. And because I only have um, 50 minutes, not 90 minutes, we should probably jump straight into them. So the first one would be the family and the wedding party formals. And I'm not talking about, you know, a bride is getting ready surrounded by her bridesmaids and I'm taking, you know, candid images of that. I'm talking about everyone standing in a line, smiling directly at the camera, formals, right? Everyone's favorite part of the day. I used to hate this part. Who loves family formals? Right, so I apparently am the only one. I used to really hate them. They used to really stress me out. But now that I'm much more organized, not only in my approach, but in the way I light these images, I actually love this part of the day. If I'm organized, if I'm set up in a way that everything is lit, it's going to look the same every single time, right? Consistent exposure, well organized, no problem. This is what my family formals used to look like. And they didn't look bad. Like, to clarify, before I started adding off-camera flash or any work with strobes to my family formals, they looked okay. I was shooting them with a nice long lens, getting great compression of my subjects off of the background that was nice and far away from them, exposing for their faces nicely. Everything looked great. But there does reach a certain point where great isn't really good enough. I am striving for excellence. And as I mentioned before, I live here. I could throw a rock in my neighborhood 
and hit six new wedding photographers in my neighborhood on my street, probably in my apartment building, right? Good enough is not good enough. We all know that the market is difficult out there now. There are so many things I have to do to differentiate myself to keep booking weddings. And taking everything up another level is truly important to me. So while this looked good, this didn't look all that different than, you know, Aunt Karen with a pretty good DSLR and a good, you know, concept of what exposure was. Anybody could take this picture. I wanted something that looked a little bit better than that. Now this is lit with off-camera light. It doesn't look crazily different than the picture beforehand. I'm still shooting with the same kind of lens. I'm still picking the same kind of background. I still like, like a little backlight coming in. But the difference is, is that I'm using a light to fill in my subject's faces, and most importantly, to fill in their eyes. So now we've got catch lights in the eyes, and we've got under eye circles filled in. And a client isn't going to be able to look at this versus this and say, well, you're obviously, I really like this person's family formals more because she has a great grasp of using a pro photo B1. Right, that's not what they're going to say, but they might be more drawn to these images. And for me personally, if I'm going to blow up a print, I'm going to put it in my house, I want it to be as wonderful as it possibly can be. So how do we achieve this? I like diagrams. Diagrams make me super happy. In my diagrams, apparently, there's only two people in this family, but that's neither here nor there. So settings and info. While I think a lot of photographers really ask, you know, what are your settings here? What are your settings here? And to a certain degree, my settings are whatever helps me take the picture, right? But when I'm working with off-camera flash, I, I just want to be a little bit more deliberate. And the settings really do matter. The difference between your ISO and your shutter speed and your f-stop and the focal length you are, all of these things are affecting the final output of your final image. So as I'm pulling images together, um, because if any of you know me at all, I am an organizational crazy person, I have an ongoing Lightroom catalog that stores all of my favorite images. And there's about 12,000 images in there now. They're all keyworded and tagged so I can find things easily. It's excessive. I don't have a social life. It's fine. But as I was pulling images together for this presentation, I was realizing that the same settings were popping up over and over and over again in the same scenario. So for family formals, I need to step it up from a speed light. I need a little bit more power than that. I'm almost always going to be using my Profoto B1 with a large umbrella. What kind of large umbrella? I don't care. I actually don't. Mine is a. Uh, 40 something inches? I don't remember. I've had it since I was a photographer for two seconds. It's been living in my car for about 10 years. It's big enough to do the job and yet small enough that it's not going to fly across the parking lot if it gets hit with a little bit of wind. That is my very technical description of it. So I have a Profoto B1 with a large umbrella and the power of that Profoto is going to vary. Am I outside at noon? Am I in a church at 6 p.m.? Am I 10 feet from my subjects because we're shooting in a catering hall and I'm shooting on the dance floor? Or is it golden hour and I've got my 70 to 200 and I'm in the middle of a park? So this is the one where the power is very, very variable, right? Or the other option, which I do sometimes, not always, but sometimes, is one speed light with a modifier. And if I'm using my speed light, I'm usually using a rogue flash bender Anybody ever used a Rogue Flash Bender? Thank you. They're awesome. b &H has them. You should look them up. And the one I use is the large one. So I'll have a speed light with that modifier, usually somewhere between half power and full power. The B1, because it has a stronger power output, it's going to be more variable in what I'm choosing. The speed light, if I'm outside, I'm almost always at full power. And if I'm inside, it's somewhere between half and full, depending on my distance to my subjects. I am almost always shooting with my 70 to 200 or my 24 to 105. As Lindsay so graciously introduced me, I am a Canon explorer of light, therefore everything I'm talking to you about is Canon. However, whatever you may happen to shoot, there are lenses around about in these focal lengths for you, right? So if you are a Nikon shooter, your 24 to 105 is not a 24 to 105, it's a 24 to 120, but one exists for you. So I like my 70 to 200, I like to get far back from my subjects, I like to compress them off of the background, it's part of the style of the way I shoot. It's the look that I enjoy. It does not have to be the look you enjoy, just what I do. I have more and more been reaching for my 24 to 105 for family formals because I often find that I'm shooting wedding party pictures at about the same time. And a lot of times I'm in a church and there's kind of pews and I'm trying to get people up high. So I need to be able to shoot long and I also need to open up 
when appropriate. Manual everything. I like aperture priority. I have a billion videos, maybe not a billion, but a lot, videos on the wedding school about aperture priority versus manual and why and what modes and meters and all of that good stuff. I really like shooting an aperture priority, but the second I'm going to pull out a speed light or a pro photo, I'm going full manual because I need to control everything. I'm not shooting them in TTL or ETTL or auto or anything like that. I want a consistent output every single time. So I put everything on manual, there are no surprises. So usually for family formals, a good starting place for me personally is somewhere between an 80th of a second and 160th of a second. ISO may vary. So let's look at what that actually looks like. Come on. There we go. So these are the different ways you can set up, and then I'm going to show you some examples of what it would look like. A Profoto B1 with an umbrella, a light stand, and an air remote. That is all you need to get going on that setup. Literally, one light, one umbrella, one light stand, make sure it's pretty sturdy, and an air remote. I don't sandbag my light stands when I'm using them because I could put 50 pounds of sandbag on a light stand and it gets hit with a big gust of wind outside and it's still gonna go over. So my assistant or I always have one hand on it. I'm paranoid, I have good insurance, I don't wanna use it, right? So that's why I don't sandbag it. Also, living here in New York, who wants to carry 50 pounds of sandbags around with them all day? I certainly do not. If you are going to be using an off-camera speed light and you are a Nikon shooter, this is what my setup looks like. I have a very simple monopod. I have a Photix transmitter and receiver. I have the Rogue large flash bender. I have a Nikon speed light. And I have a battery pack so that it helps the flash recycle quickly. This was my setup for many a Nikon year. What I'm doing now as a Canon shooter, I have one Canon Speedlight, the 600 EXRT, and I have the STE3, oh my gosh, you can't say this fast, STETR3 transmitter. And what that does is it does the exact same thing as a Photix transmitter and receiver. Because in the 600 EXRT, the receiver is built into the flash. So all I need is a transmitter, much like with a Profoto. There's a receiver built in. You can use the air remote. It will let them talk to each other. My Nikons did not have that capability, so I needed both a transmitter and a receiver. But with Canon, I have the transmitter and the receiver is built into that speed light. What that enables me to do and what I really like is the transmitter that sits on top of my camera, I can actually manually change my flash settings myself, which is super helpful when I'm in the middle of a reception and my assistant has zoned out and is watching what's going on instead of watching me and I need her to do something. It happens. And this is what it looks like, right? Whether I am inside with one off-camera speed light or outside with one pro photo high up on a light stand, this is the look I'm going for. Now, if you remember from the diagram, I'm a good distance from my subjects, and my light is just a little bit off to the side. I don't want it to get too directional, or else I'm going to have crazy kind of lit sides and shadow sides. I don't want to put one up on each side, because again, it's a wedding, and I have to go really quickly with what I'm doing, right? I just want a slight direction to the light so it's not so obviously flash lit. And the settings that I'm looking at is a 70 to 270 millimeters, F10, F10 because call me crazy, but I want both lines in complete focus, ISO 2500 because that's where it needed to be, 125th of a second, easy. That was my settings for almost all of these formals. Now, when I got, you know, maybe just mom and dad, bride and mom, bride and dad, I don't need to be at F10. So I would come down to 5.6, which would let me lower my ISO. But anytime I have a group that's two lines, you need to make sure that I'm F10, F11, F16, somewhere around there, so that everybody is nice and sharp and in focus. This is what it looks like when I'm outside. Same setup, same angle of light, different location, different background. And the settings look pretty similar. 120 millimeters, 5'6", because we've got one line. ISO 400, it's outside and it's bright, 160th of a second. Now, if you are stuck, there are lots of ways that you can go about obtaining your exposure, right? You could take some of these settings and plug them into your camera and set your flash on something and take a picture and look and see what it looks like. Maybe your flash is too strong and you need to dial it down. Maybe everything is well exposed, but the faces aren't filled in and your flash isn't strong enough. 
So as you practice this more and more, you'll start seeing common issues, and you'll learn more about how to fix them, right? So for example, what I'm looking for when I'm outside, I'm looking for the same sort of thing every single time. I'd like a background that's decently far away, so you can use a longer lens, get really pretty compression. I'd like a variety of lighting on my background. Dappled light on my subject, no. Dappled light on my background, yes. Because it gives a really nice sort of dimension to what's going on behind my subjects. Now, if I'm not sure how to get to an exposure, what I will do is I will expose for the background first. So I'll turn off my flash. And if I plug these settings into my camera, f5.6, ISO 400, 160 of a second, turn the flash off, my subject's faces would be about a stop and a half to two stops underexposed. Background would look great. Faces would be dark. I'm using the flash to fill in those faces. So a very simple way to get started is come up with your manual exposure that makes your subjects two stops underexposed and use your flash to fill in. That's how I got started. And when you have that setup and you are humming along with that setup, you can shoot whatever you want. I can shoot the whole bridal party. I can shoot the bride and her mom. I can shoot the groom by himself. I can shoot the bride and groom together. My settings don't change. My light doesn't change. Nothing changes unless my lighting condition outside changes. If suddenly it becomes overcast, if I'm shooting family formals and it's 90 minutes of formals and the sun's tracking across the sky, yes, sometimes you might have to make changes. But for the most part, you're set for a while. And all of a sudden, family formals aren't so terrible because they're pretty easy. And then all you have to do is wrangle people. That's the hard part. Portraits of the couple. So this is what I'm usually looking for when I am lighting a couple together. I like backlight. I hate the shade. A day like today where it's overcast, some wedding photographers would wake up in the morning and be like, this is great. I can shoot anywhere. And I wake up in the morning and think, oh my gosh, today I have to make the sun. Because this is what my clients are coming to expect from me, a very directional light source. And if it's not there, now I have to make it. They're looking for something like this. Beautiful backlit portraits during golden hour. Very dramatic light. So we'll play a fun game called natural light flash or video light. Nope. Natural light. You're a cheater. I know you. Natural light. But it could be anything. It could be a flash. It could be a video light. It, anything. This is, um, anybody who's local, this is Liberty Warehouse. Next to Liberty Warehouse, there's actually a cool little wine bar. And there's a very dark kind of tasting area with a big window. And we went into the tasting area, and I put them against the dark background, and here we go. What's that? <laughs> I like that Lindsay Adler is even like, Ert. But she's right, it was video light. <laughs> But it could have been natural light. It could have been a window. It could have been a gridded speed light. It could have been anything, right? The point is, it doesn't matter. And if you guys can't tell, your clients sure can't tell. Natural light, again. What about that? You're all looking at me really angrily. I'm not trying to trick you. Flash. It's actually a Pro Photo B1. They are standing in a loading dock. We're in the reception ballroom. And you know how in like the bigger reception ballrooms, like the convention halls, there's always a loading dock where they can open the door and bring big things into the ballroom. It's pouring rain. This groom's a photographer. I knew what they wanted out of their images. It, I mean, it is pouring rain to the point that we can't go outside even under umbrellas because it's coming down sideways. So I'm not going to send them in the rain, but I'll send my assistant in the rain, which was a little cruel. But she basically held a Pro Photo B1 in her hands, not, no modifier, no light stand, nothing, full power, climbed off the loading deck, went out in the parking lot, and she knew to hold that where if there was a sun, I would want the light to be coming from there. So whenever I take my flash off the camera or pull out a Pro Photo or a video light, I think if there were a sun, where would I want it to be coming from? And that's where I put my light. So it is 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It is pouring rain. I'm laying on the floor of a ballroom while they're building the reception around me. They're standing in the loading dock as close to outside as they can get without getting wet. And my assistant's hating me, soaking wet, out in the parking lot. But I bought her Starbucks. We were fine. She still works for me. We're good. What about this? Video light. Yes. Could have been anything. 
We're in the, this is the Neon Museum in Las Vegas. There are lights all over all of these exhibits. I could have put them in a spotlight. Could have been anything. The point is, it doesn't matter. The point is to know all of your tools inside and out so that without even thinking, you can pick up the right tool for the job and also understand there could be multiple right tools for the job. And my right tools for the job could be different from Lindsay's, could be different from Neil's, could be different from anybody, right? So, settings and info. If you saw a diagram of how I like to light a couple, it would look a lot like this, except the generic lighting source that I picked to be in my diagram would be the sun. And I have enjoyed lighting like this forever. In Florida, it was how I survived shooting on the beach and making my images different. Uh, when I moved up to Philadelphia, the very first workshop I ever, I moved to New York and was going back and forth between New York and Philly, I took Cliff Mountner's Lighting and Skill Set Boot Camp and it went so well that I married him for continual ongoing education. It's going really fantastically for all involved. Um, but picking up things from Cliff, picking up things from Zach and his One Light workshop that I went to so long ago, everything that I've read and looked at has helped me come up with my own style. And my own style is also very heavily influenced by theater, because that's what I went to school for. And my parents are so happy to know that the four years that they spent paying for me to learn theater and by, um, by the wayside theatrical lighting has all gone into the way I like to light my wedding and portrait images. So, if I had a son, I would want a son here. But I don't always have a son there, so we have to make a son. So settings and info, it's either the sun, or it's a pro photo, or it's a speed light, or it's a video light. And my video light of choice, which you can actually, for those of you who are here, you can see it out there, by the team at Light in Motion. It is called the Stella. It's the Stella Pro 5000. Don't look at it directly when you turn it on. It is the brightest, most beautiful video light source that I have ever worked with. And it's my go-to for any sort of portrait where I'm going to need a video light. Again, lenses, 70 to 200 is always a given. I love that lens I always have. 135-20. I love it for portraits. It's beautiful. If you are an icon shooter, you have the 105-14. I really like the longer focal length with the 1-4 with the 2-0. I think it creates a really beautiful look and plays very nicely with my style of photography. And I'm in manual if I'm using a flash. If I'm using the sun, I might be in manual. I might be in aperture priority. Depends on the day, depends on the sun. Come on, here we go. All right, natural light. So let's say that I'm putting this together and I want to shoot a portrait with natural light and I have sun coming from a beautiful direction. There's sun coming from a beautiful direction. 70 millimeters. F2.8, aperture priority. My exposure compensation was down uh, 1.7, ISO 1800, 160th of a second. There you go. Very nice, very clean, exposing for the highlights. This is how I like to use light. Same concept. Light is still coming from an angle from behind them. It's showing up a little bit less in this picture because they're against a slightly paler background. The darker your background, the more that rim light is really going to show up, right? 200 millimeters, 3.2, aperture priority, exposure compensation minus 0.3, ISO 450, 400th of a second. You have to make sure if you are shooting with natural light, if you're not using a flash to freeze your subjects, you need to make sure that your shutter speed is fast enough for the lens that you're holding, right? If you have a 70 to 200 and you have moving subjects, you don't want to shoot it at a 60th of a second, right? Same thing, natural light, same looking settings, right? Everything's starting to look a little bit similar under the same conditions. But let's say I need to bring out a flash. Same setup. Flashes behind my subjects from a slight angle. Nice long lens. Looks like this. This does not look unlike sun. These clients were amazing. They were getting married here in the city at the Bryant Park Grill, which is beautiful but it's in Bryant Park, which is crowded. And they loved my images in the sun. They were really excited about it. We talked about it a bunch. And then they gave me their timeline, which involved them getting married at 5 o'clock in the winter, which meant that we were outside in Bryant Park at 4 o'clock in the winter shooting their portraits, which meant that it was dark. Because it's in New York, 
the sun is setting. It goes behind the buildings before it actually sets, so you lose your light before the sun is gone, which is just, I love it so much, it's just great. Makes working here so easy. So I had to deal with that, and then I had to deal with the fact that it was an overcast December day. But they wanted the sun, so what did I have to do? I had to make them the sun. So this is an off-camera light held at the exact same location that I would want the sun to be if there were sun. 200 millimeters f4, ISO 640, a hundredth of a second. And you can see now I can start dropping my shutter speed a little bit lower as I want to let in or not let in ambient light. But because I do have a flash freezing my subjects, I don't have to be quite so afraid, and I don't have to be shooting at a 400th of a second. Same thing. Settings exactly the same. So these clients had a very interesting request. They, her grandfather, great-great-grandfather and his great-great-grandfather both worked on the Verrazano Bridge. And they didn't find this out until they were planning their wedding and they were talking about locations and talking about places that were important to them for portraits. And it came to, came to pass that for some reason they wanted pictures with the Verrazano Bridge in the background. And of course, that's not a normal request. It's not a pretty location. And so I asked them why, and when they told me, I was like, okay, we have to make this look great. So yes, I absolutely did shoot some of these at F10, F11, so the bridge is very sharply in focus in the background. But I also wanted some that showed where I was, but focused more on them and less on the background. So this is one speed light on a monopod held by my assistant. You can actually see where it's coming from if you look to the upper top left. You can't see it on that screen so much, you can see it on mine. You can see where the light is bursting in a little bit from up and over there by the arch of the bridge. But I'm at 200 millimeters, 2.8, ISO 2500, and I'm at a 50th of a second. If this were the sun, I would never try this at a 50th of a second. But because I'm freezing my subject, 50th of a second, totally fine. Raining, pouring outside. Wedding venue in Manhattan in a fine neighborhood, nothing crazy, just a nice neighborhood on the Upper West Side. They wanted to get street portraits at night. They didn't want an umbrella, they wanted to go outside, but they didn't want it to look like it was raining. Not really sure what you're supposed to do there, but there was a slight awning, like one, just a very little awning over the outside front doors. So I put them outside under the awning and I had my assistant hold a flash off camera. This is not coming from an angle behind them. And this is sort of to prove that yes, I do have a favorite way that I like to light, but that can't be the only way that I like, that I like to light, right? So you need to learn all of your tools inside and out, but you also need to not feel stuck to do the same thing every time. So yes, I might like a good rim light, but I also can't shoot every single portrait with rim light because not only will the gallery start to look the same after a while, it's doing my clients a little bit of a disservice. It would be like shooting the whole wedding with only one focal length, right? But the settings are very similar. 150 millimeters, 2.8, ISO 800, hundredth of a second. Full on rain, willing to go outside. I am soaked up to the knees, it is absolutely awful. It was really fun because they did not care. She's wet, he's wet, it's raining. Light from an angle from behind, same as before. Settings looking awfully similar to what's before. So I'm adjusting my shutter speed as I'm going along to either let in or cut out ambient light. Video light. So we're, this is technically about off-camera flash, but we're gonna pretend video light's off-camera flash, that's fine. Setup looks an awful lot the same as any flash work that I'm doing. But sometimes I will trick that around as well. I'll bring it in the front, I'll bring it from the side. Again, I'm thinking, what kind of scene do I have in front of me? How do I want to illuminate my subjects to set them apart from the scene? But you'll notice that my settings start to look a little bit different when I'm working with a video light. Because my video light, I don't like this side of the podium, I'm going the other side, okay. The video light can't freeze action in the way that a flash can. So if I'm at 70 millimeters, great, that looks normal. F4, great, ISO 6400. Because even my Stella at full power is not the same as the output of a flash. So I've got to get my ISO up there. It's dark. Because I also have to be at a faster shutter speed. Because I'm not freezing the action. That's making sense. So as my shutter speed gets faster, my ISO starts to climb higher. My other options here, if I don't like this, if I don't want to be at ISO 6400, that's fine. I can put away my video light, I can pull out my speed light and create the exact same thing. 
video light. I often like to reach for my video light if I'm going to want to shoot at 2.8 or 2 or 1.8 or 1.4. Video light. Same settings. I was, um, I climbed in between two Christmas trees. That's what you do. So again, these are sort of those example images again. Now you know where the light's coming from. Now you know what the settings were. Now you know how to make this light in any scenario. Let's throw one more into the mix. Let's talk about silhouettes. Now, I love silhouettes. I tend to over silhouette sometimes because I think they're really fun. But a silhouette is kind of tricky to do. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you're trying to make a silhouette, but then you go home and you download the image and you realize that, you know, by the time you got your subjects dark enough to make a true silhouette, now the background is a little bit too dark and it looks muddy, so there's not really the separation that you want. It just didn't really kind of work. I will often use an additional light to make my background brighter if I can. Now, with that to be said, if it's sunset, I can't fire a Profoto B1 at the sky and make it brighter. But if they're against a building, and you're going to see some examples in a second, I can help a silhouette along the way. So for example, sometimes I get a rare opportunity to find one. This is at a regular, everyday, awesome reception venue. They had up lights, which are pretty great. And I saw the up lights were making this bright splash of light on the wall. So I had my subject stand right in front of that splash of light. I created an exposure that would allow them to become so underexposed that they became a silhouette. But yet the background was still so bright that I had that great stop difference, that exposure difference between subject background. But here, the difference was not quite good enough, right? I put them against this sign. I thought it looked super cool. It said jackpot. They were big into Vegas. And it was very appropriate for them. But the motel part of the sign wasn't lit up quite right. So in this instance, you can take a speed light, you can take a pro photo, you can take a video light, and aim it not at your subjects, but aim it at your background, and help brighten up your background to give you that exposure difference. 80 millimeter f4, ISO 6400, 250th of a second. And again, my ISO is higher, my shutter speed is faster because I'm working with a video light, not a flash. So now let's go to the reception. And you know, I'm almost always going to be using an off-camera flash for family pictures and wedding party pictures. And sometimes I use one for portraits of the couple, not always, but always during the reception is time for off-camera flash. So, off-camera flash for the reception, first dances, parent dances, other dances. We're going to start here first, because there are several different scenarios, and they're handled slightly differently. Off-camera flash. Wow, that looks really familiar. Same type of lighting setup. However, the pro photo is gone by now. It has been bagged up. It is not going to be used again. I don't need a pro photo B1 for the reception. Lots of people use them. Lots of people put them up in the corners. It looks amazing. This is just what I do. I like one speed light with a modifier. And when I hit the reception, it's my Canon speed light. It's the little Stofen dome that comes with it. That's it. I don't put anything else on it. The rogue flash bender is gone. I don't have any fancy plastic contraptions that bounce light in crazy directions, just that little Stofen that it comes with on a monopod, and that's it. It is held by my assistant. I don't put it on a light stand. What do people do at receptions? Drink and dance. What do I not want them near? My light on a stick, right? I know a lot of people who'll put light stands up next to DJ speakers or put them up in corners. It would just be my luck that somebody is going to cha-cha slide into the corner and take the light down on their heads. And I don't want that. I also find that if I have my light on a monopod, I can have my assistant move. And it's a lot easier to have my assistant move while holding a monopod than it is to have her pick up a light stand and put it somewhere else. So I have a variety of lenses that I use for a reception, and it really depends on the reception. If I'm shooting a first dance in this room, 70 to 200 all the way. But if I'm shooting a first dance in this room and they have 800 guests and the dance floor is the size of four of these chairs pushed together, I might not be able to stand far enough back to use my 70 to 200. So it might be my 24 to 105. I always carry two cameras with me. So I might have one on one and one on the other. But my 28 millimeter prime and my 35 millimeter prime also get used a lot during receptions. 
So let's say I've got a 70 to 200 on one. I might go crazy and put a 28 on the other. These are the four lenses that I have that get used the most during receptions. And I would say for first dances and parent dances, it's going to be the 70 to 200. It's going to be the 24 to 105. By the time I get into the all dancing all the time part of the night, it's going to be a 28 or it's going to be a 35. Manual everything, again, no matter what. Manual everything, so much easier. My flash indoors for this sort of stuff is usually between a quarter power and an eighth power, depending on the size of the room and distance of flash to subject. 80th of a second to 160th of a second, again, depending on the ambient light in the room and what I want to do with it. I'm almost always at F4. I like everyone in focus. It's the best. And my ISO fluctuates wildly. Let's say I'm in this room, and it looks like this. It's real dark. Maybe a higher ISO. Because I want to balance that ambient light with my flash. I don't want my flash to be so prominent that it cuts out the up lights, that it cuts out the candles on the tables, such like that. So I'm not afraid to bring my ISO up higher as needed. And this is what a first dance usually looks like. My assistant, so you see the three bridesmaids over here, the one that's clapping on the edge, my assistant's standing right next to her. Right next to her. 70 millimeters, F4, ISO 2000, a hundredth of a second. Looks an awful lot, not too far off from the settings for family formals. Same thing. I left this one in here because in case you can't tell where my assistant is, she's in it. <laughs> you can actually see the light up there. It was like the last time we used the rogue flash bender at a reception, so you just didn't really need it. It was spreading the light around too much. But you can see exactly where she's standing to make that light. 28 millimeters, F4, 28 millimeters. See how small that dance floor really is. And this is the money dance. It was a Greek wedding. And this is a big deal. They come out. They throw money at them. It's fun. I actually really like them. But I wanted to show the whole scene. I wanted to show everybody in there. I wanted to show what was going on. And so a 28 was a great choice. I was just kind of an idiot and did not crop out my assistant. But my assistant stays in one spot, and I move. So if we're during a first dance and she's lighting it the way she does, she's not going to move. I'm going to move. Because the last thing in the world I need is people moving on the dance floor and my assistant trying to figure out what I'm trying to do. And now there's three separate entities moving. If she stays, I will always know where the light is coming from. So I can use it as a backlight. I can come stand next to her and use it as a nice, even, flat light, right? But if she's moving all over the place, I'm trying to signal to her. I'm trying to follow the couple who's like dancing all over the floor. I prefer her, for her to stay put. Same wedding, same dance, just groom and mom instead of bride and dad. Same settings. So my assistant in this one with the light is standing. If you're standing here looking at that table, she's standing just to that side of the table. Ooh, sorry, I screamed straight in my mic for that one. And nothing changed. This is the parent dance that was the very next dance. The only thing that changed, I changed my angle a little bit. And my assistant's probably standing about three feet from the groom. She scooted over just a bit. But I also use on-camera flash. I, you know, this is an off-camera flash class, but I would be really remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that I do shoot a lot of on-camera flash, but at one point in time during the day only. And it's during the all dancing all the time part of the day. I have one flash. It is on my camera. And I don't put up other flashes in the room. I've tried it. I don't like the look. For me, there are lots of people who do a multi-light setup in a reception in a very dynamic way that matches their style. Every time I tried to do that, it never really matched my style. It looked different than the rest of my work. So I actually prefer one single on-camera speed light. Looks a lot like that. It's a flash on a camera. So I have one speed light. It has the same modifier, just that little Stofen cap. And I bounce it just a little bit behind me. So if the flash, if I'm bouncing it off the ceiling and it's like this, I turn it one click to bounce behind me. It gives a slightly different bounce direction than it does if it's bouncing straight off the ceiling. Have you ever tried bouncing off the ceiling and they're really well lit on their faces and then the light kind of falls off their bodies as it falls down? This, bouncing it a little bit behind, I found it makes me raise my ISO a little bit, but it gives a more natural look to the lighting. 
almost always with my 28 or my 35. I like a prime lens for dancing. My flash is on manual. Now, this is pretty easy because I have a 28 millimeter. I'm almost always the same distance to my subjects while I'm shooting dancing. Therefore, with manual flash, I don't have to worry about if I'm using a 24 to 120 or 24 to 105, am I zooming in? Am I keeping my distance properly? I'm using a prime. So as long as I'm about the same distance from my subjects every time, and as long as the light in the room is staying the same, the images are going to look the same with manual flash, right? Manual everything, somewhere between a 15th of a second and a 60th of a second. Again, I can go to 15th of a second, because I'm freezing my subjects with the flash. F4, because I like it. And my ISO is wherever it needs to be to get the job done, depending on how dark the room is. And it looks a bit like this. Could I put lights up in the corner? Absolutely. Would it change the look of the image? Yes. Do I personally like how that looks? Not for my work. It doesn't work. However, that doesn't just mean I'm shooting willy-nilly into whatever direction I feel like it. I'm trying to consider my backgrounds. And one of my favorite backgrounds is if there are any lights coming from the band or the DJ, I like to try to shoot into them because it gives me a really nice backlight. Have you ever been to a reception and they turn on those really horrible lights that are like laser lights and they're spotted? Don't shoot with the spotted lights, shoot into the spotted lights. And then it becomes a whole lot easier. So things like that. That's not my light. That is the videographer's light. It was the power of the sun. So I used it for the powers of good instead of evil and shot straight into it. There we go. With the tables behind, with the ambient light, with the up light, Anything that I can do to get light in the back of my image, if there's uplighting, if they've got centerpieces, I don't want to shoot into a dark wall where there's nothing, because then I'm not going to have any separation. At that point, I might want to consider adding in an extra light, but if I can separate my subject from the background with existing light that's there, I don't need to. So sometimes it's shooting into the lights hanging from the ceiling. Toasts and blessings. Always off-camera flash. Always, always. So the setup changes just a little bit, and this one involves my assistant to actually watch me. She actually has to pay attention to me at this point. Because she's going to stand midway in between the person giving the toast and the person receiving the toast. And she's going to turn the light in whichever direction I'm shooting. So let's say she's here, person giving the toast is here, person receiving the toast is there. I'm over on the same side, other side of her, we're making a nice diamond, and I'm shooting over this way. She's going to turn the light this way. And she keeps her eyes on me and adjusts the light as necessary. Again, one speed light with a modifier. Same thing, monopod, modifier, super easy. 70 to 200 or 24 to 105. I really like separating my subject from the background, especially during toasts when there's a lot of clutter and a lot of other things going on in the room. Manual everything, as per usual. Flash between a quarter and an eighth power. Again, 80th of a second to 160th of a second, sometimes. F4, and ISO is wherever it needs to be. Again, depending on the room. And it looks like that. Nice and easy. 150 millimeters, F4, ISO 1600, a hundredth of a second. Nice separation off of the background. Nice kind of lovely light on the subject's faces. Nice even exposure that balances the ambient light with the flash. And because my assistant is standing in one spot, I can move. I can go and use the light and shoot it directly at them. I can have it come from an angle. I could walk 50 feet through the room. As long as my transmitter is still talking to my flash, I'm good. <coughs> Excuse me. I will let you read the settings while I drink water real quick. All right. Same thing. Rinse and repeat, toast after toast, for those of you who don't know me. 200 millimeters, F4, ISO 1600, a hundredth of a second. I'm pretty sure you've seen these exact same settings before. And then I'll turn it around and I will take reaction pictures of the couple. So when people ask, how can you take a picture of whoever's giving the toast and whoever is receiving the toast, well, it's easy. I just turn. And my assistant watches me and she doesn't even have to watch who she's shooting, she just turns the light. Same thing here, 200 millimeters F4, ISO 800, hundredth of a second. 
And then my assistant stayed in the same spot, subject stayed in the same spot, and I walked around to in front of the band, which was behind her parents who were giving the toast, and shot straight at the scene. And the settings all stayed the same. So what happens when you're shooting the toasts and instead of, you know, I always try to talk to the DJ, I always try to talk to the band about having the person giving the toast on the dance floor. And the reason for that is that everyone can see them, right? If they're standing in the middle of the dance floor, everyone can see. If they stand behind the subjects, the subjects kind of have to turn around to look at the person giving the toast, right? So I proceed as I normally would. I'm just now not going to have another angle to shoot out onto the dance floor. Cake cutting. When I made a diagram, there was no cake, so I picked a record. It's round. It works. But boy, this looks an awful lot like literally every single other lighting diagram I've shown you, right? Light coming from an angle, subjects dancing on a record, as you do. And things are, again, looking really similar. You've got the speed light with the modifier. You've got the same two lenses I've been using the whole day, manual everything, per usual, because you will find it's actually easier. If I don't have to wonder what's going to happen when I go in TTL or go in auto or ETTL or anything that makes a decision for me, if I'm making the decisions for my camera, I know what's going to happen every single time I push the shutter. So manual everything, flash again, quarter to eighth, somewhere around in there, 80th of a second to 160th of a second, f2.8 to f4. Sometimes I'll drop to 2.8 if I'm trying to knock out a really crazy, like busy background during a cake cutting. And then the ISO goes where it needs to go. And it looks a bit like this. Sometimes I'll have my assistant move around to the side. Sometimes I'll have her more to the back. And sometimes it really depends on what the subjects do. Because if they make a, like, a last minute move, I might need to have her come a little bit forward so it's still lit. Have you ever been shooting, trying to shoot off-camera flash at a reception, and all of a sudden you realize that you're sh like sending a huge shadow the size of the cake onto your subjects? Yes, sometimes I might have to have her move. But again, the settings are looking very similar to everything else I've been doing pretty much this whole day. And there is getting a little dimension. If I'm asking her where to put the light, I ask her to try to aim it for the subject's face without hitting the cake. And if you have any other questions for me, you need to find me later, as I said before, at Susan Stripling Photography on Instagram, susanstripling.com. I'm on the internet always. Thanks, guys.